20-year-old Takahiko Ina was prepared to die. It was April 28, 1945, and he was making the final preparations for his first mission as a pilot in the Japanese Army, a mission that was designed to be his last. Once he took off, there would be no turning back. He had been trained to suppress his emotions and convinced to die for the honor of his country. He and his fellow kamikaze pilots had been ordered not to return. Instead, they were embarking on a one-way mission that would only end when they had crashed their planes into the side of an American battleship in a suicidal mission that he had been told would bring honor to his family and glory to him. And yet the young student couldn't help but wonder, what if a kamikaze pilot survived? By 1944, after nearly five years of brutal and bloody warfare across Europe, World War II had started to turn to the favor of the Allies in the European theater. After the D-Day invasion, they had repelled the Nazis from France in the West, and with the help of the Russians, the Allies were giving them hell on the Eastern Front too. It seemed like only a matter of time before the Nazis surrendered, but the war was not yet over for the Allies, particularly for the US, who had entered the war late and would go on to fight countless battles against the Japanese long after the war in Europe was over. The US had tried to stay out of the war, but Japan had forced their hand when on December 7, 1941, they launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, prompting the US to enter the war in full force. Some of the bloodiest battles of the entire war would take place in the seas and sky of the Pacific Theater in the final years of the war as the US turned their attention to making Japan pay for Pearl Harbor. Facing the full might of the US military machine, the desperate Japanese needed a new way to fight the Americans, and so the legendary kamikaze was born. The word kamikaze means divine wind, a reference to a fabled moment in ancient Japanese history when an unexpected typhoon saved Japan from a horde of Mongol invaders in 1281. The US, though, had another name for these fanatical fighters. They called them baka bombs, from the Japanese word baka, which means idiot. Since the kamikaze planes were relatively easy to shoot down as they barreled directly toward the US ships, the US military couldn't wrap their minds around what would drive so many young Japanese men to sacrifice their lives in such a spectacular and final way. Still, the kamikaze were able to inflict some serious damage on the US and her allies. Though only about one in five kamikaze pilots managed to hit their targets, they succeeded in sinking 34 ships and damaging hundreds of others over the final years of the war. During the fierce Battle of Okinawa alone, kamikaze pilots were responsible for the deaths of 5,000 US Navy seamen, the greatest loss of life in a single battle in the history of the US Navy. The kamikaze tactics were also an effective form of psychological warfare. Every kamikaze mission was a suicide mission, and none of the thousands of kamikaze pilots who took to the air at the end of World War II were expected to return from their first and final flight. The US and her allies could not believe that so many young Japanese men were willing to take such drastic actions to defeat their enemies, and they lived in constant fear of the next desperate kamikaze attack. History remembers the kamikaze as fanatics who were honored to die for their emperor and their country, but those who survived tell a somewhat different story. In writing his 2008 book on the kamikaze, Danger's Hour, author Maxwell Taylor Kennedy had expected to find a story of fanaticism and fervent ideology among the kamikaze, but he was surprised by what his research uncovered. He found that the kamikaze were not unlike their American counterparts in their patriotism and self-sacrifice, calling them extraordinarily patriotic but at the same time extraordinarily idealistic. By design, kamikaze pilots were not intended to survive their first and only mission. And yet most of what we know about the kamikaze comes from those who survived and lived to tell their stories. So what happened if a kamikaze pilot survived? Some, like Hisao Horiyama, never had the chance to fulfill their glorious final mission and lived to share the real story of what drove thousands of kamikaze pilots to undertake their suicidal missions. Horiyama was 21 years old in late 1944 when he was pulled from his artillery battalion to join a new elite force of airmen. Japan was losing the war, and the kamikaze were an essential part of their last-ditch effort to turn the tide in their favor. Kamikaze missions were flying up until the very minute that the war ended on August 15, 1945. Young Horiyama was a devoted subject of his emperor, and he relished the opportunity to have his moment of glory in the name of his beloved country. Horiyama had completed his training and was preparing for his final glorious mission when the news came down that the Japanese had surrendered and the war was over. Though he was grateful that the emperor had ended the war, he was also regretful. I felt bad that I hadn't been able to sacrifice myself for my country, he told reporters in 2015 at the age of 92. My comrades who had died would be remembered in infinite glory, but I had missed my chance to die in the same way. I felt like I had let everyone down. 
How were the Japanese able to convince so many young men in their prime, like Horiyama, to willingly and even enthusiastically give their lives for their country in these suicide missions? In short, they were trained to die. An excerpt from the Kamikaze Training Manual illustrates just how thoroughly these young men were indoctrinated. It reads, When you eliminate all thoughts about life and death, you will be able to totally disregard your earthly life. This will also enable you to concentrate your attention on eradicating the enemy with unwavering determination, meanwhile reinforcing your excellence in flight skills. Honor is an extremely important part of Japanese culture, and kamikaze training focused on reinforcing this ideology and convincing these young men that their sacrifice would bring glory to them in the afterlife and honor to their families who they were leaving behind. Most believed that Emperor Hirohito and the nation of Japan were one and the same, and they were conditioned to be willing to die for him. They were trained to suppress all emotions and made to believe that they had been specially chosen for this sacrifice, a great honor in Japanese culture. In some cases, Emperor Hirohito himself would visit the kamikaze training school, attending their graduation ceremonies on a symbolic white horse, and personally requesting their services as kamikaze pilots. During their training, the pilots would practice the daring moves that would be required to complete their missions, repeatedly flying their planes almost vertically toward the ground to simulate crashing into an enemy target, before sharply reversing course just before crashing. These exercises prepared them for the day when they would follow through on their dive and plummet to glory and certain death. Their intense training was incredibly effective in convincing thousands of young Japanese men to sacrifice their lives for their country and die for a worthy cause. By the end of World War II, at least 2,500 pilots had given their lives in kamikaze missions. Many history books put the number closer to 4,000. At the end of their training, kamikaze pilots were given a slip of paper with three options on it. They could either volunteer passionately, simply agree to volunteer, or they could refuse, in theory anyway. Many survivors claimed that those who refused were simply told to try again and to pick the right answer next time. By the end of the war, the Japanese were desperate for troops. Up until that point, university students had been exempt from military service, but by 1944, many young scholars, like Takehiko Ina, found themselves drafted into Japan's new elite force of kamikaze pilots. 20-year-old Ina had been studying economics at the prestigious Waseda University when he was pulled from school and thrust into kamikaze training. Japanese culture places a high value on the firstborn sons, and thus they were exempted from the ranks of kamikaze to protect their family lines. Ina, as a younger son, certainly had his reservations about his kamikaze mission, but he welcomed the opportunity to bring honor to his family on a level uncommon for younger sons. Ina completed his training, volunteered to give his life for his country, and prepared to die, but fate had other plans for him. By the late stages of the war, the depleted Japanese were not only lacking troops but were using out-of-date and damaged aircraft that had been stripped down and adapted for kamikaze missions. These aging planes would turn out to be Ina's salvation. On his first attempt, his plane failed to take off, and Ina's suicide mission was over before it had even begun. His second attempt made it off the ground, but engine troubles forced him to make an emergency landing before he got anywhere close to his target. During his third and final attempt, more engine troubles forced him to land in the sea, and Ina and his two crew members had to swim to a nearby island where they were stranded for two and a half months. By the time they were rescued, the war was over, and Ina would never again have to prepare for certain death. Though the kamikaze trained to die, not all of them did. Those who returned fell into one of two groups, those who were forced to abort their missions due to mechanical troubles, weather, or failure to locate targets, and those who were unable to go through with their mission out of fear. The two groups were treated very differently by their superiors. Those like Ina, who were able to prove that they had returned for reasons beyond their control, were not punished. The Japanese could not afford to lose any pilots, so these kamikaze simply prepared to try again. Those who had backed out, though, were shamed and punished physically and mentally. Still, the depleted Japanese could not afford to lose even these reticent pilots, and the punishment was limited to ensure that the pilot could make another attempt. Even under these extraordinary circumstances, though, the Japanese military's tolerance had its limits. Surviving kamikaze pilots recall the fate of one pilot who returned from a total of nine final flights, each time unable to go through with his mission. After his ninth attempt, he was finally executed for cowardice. To combat this natural tendency to pull out at the last minute, the Japanese implemented a number of strategies designed to encourage pilots to go through with their deadly mission. Pilots flew in a squadron in the hopes that peer pressure would ensure pilots followed through with their mission, and kamikaze were even given some liquid courage prior to takeoff to help them ease their doubts. Some say that the planes were loaded with only enough fuel for a one-way trip to ensure there was no hope of returning, 
and each pilot was made to compose a will and a letter to their families prior to their last flight. The Japanese kamikaze pilots of World War II went down in history as the fanatical and deranged samurai of the skies, committed to dying for the honor of their emperor and country, and willing to give their lives for glory. In reality, though, they were not given any real choice in the matter, with most agreeing to volunteer at the risk of dishonoring their families and being sent to die in dishonor anyways on the front lines of battle. In a desperate last-ditch bid to turn the war back in their favor, the Japanese sent thousands of young men in their prime to die on suicidal kamikaze missions. Despite this, few kamikaze did return from their missions and lived to tell their stories. Thanks to them, we know that the kamikaze were not all fanatical or deranged, but instead were desperate and afraid of dishonoring their families if a kamikaze survived. The pilot takes a deep breath and prays. He sights his target and banks hard to the left. The engine roars under the strain of gravity. The target is lined up. The pilot pushes down on the flight stick. The plane dives toward the ocean below. Wedged in between the metal ring of the tachometer is a picture of the Emperor of Japan. Clutched tightly in the pilot's hand is a piece of cloth with his family's name embroidered on it. A feeling of calm washes over him as the battleship gets closer and closer and closer. Less than a year prior, the Japanese soldier sits in a large barracks with a bunch of his comrades. They're playing cards and smoking cigarettes. A veil of smoke fills the air as the soldiers enjoy some downtime after a campaign on a small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The soldier has fought in several battles for the Emperor. His duty is to defend Japan against the Allied threat. He wears a freshly wrapped bandage around his shoulder where an enemy bullet lodged itself in the last battle. A high-ranking officer enters the barracks. All of the men immediately stand at attention. The commander walks up to the Japanese soldier and hands him a plain white envelope. In it is a folded piece of paper. The soldier takes out the paper and reads it. It's a letter directly from the Emperor. The letter asks the question, will you serve your country as a kamikaze pilot and bring glory to Japan? Below these words are three options, volunteer willingly, volunteer, or no. However, there is really only one option that any soldier can choose, unless he wants to bring dishonor upon himself and his family. The soldier checks the volunteer willingly box and hands the envelope back to the officer. The other soldiers congratulate him as he's about to make a great sacrifice for his country. He'll be a hero. The soldier packs his possessions into his standard issue tan sack and follows the officer out of the barracks. He's put on a transport to be taken to the closest air base where he'll be trained by the Japanese Air Force. The entire trip, the soldier thinks about what lies ahead. He thinks about the honor that being a kamikaze pilot will bring to his family. The sadness of not seeing his mother again. The pain of being engulfed in a fiery explosion. But to die for one's emperor is a privilege. The newly recruited kamikaze pilot reaches the air base where he'll be trained. He stands in a row of soldiers with the same determined look on their faces. He wonders if this is just a facade or does every one of these kamikaze pilots believe in doing the will of the emperor for the glory of Japan, even if it costs their lives. The soldiers stand at attention. The commanding officer announces that they're about to be in the presence of greatness. It'll be a privilege that so many others in the country only dream of. They're about to meet the Emperor. Emperor Hirohito rides down the dirt road on a white horse toward the newly recruited kamikaze pilots. The sun reflects off of his medals and sword. The horse gallops in a steady cadence reminiscent of the beats of a war drum. Hirohito stops just in front of the line of men. The soldiers look upon the Emperor, their eyes wide, trying to keep their resolve even though they're filled with admiration and awe. Emperor Hirohito tells the kamikaze pilots that it is their duty to bring honor to Japan. He's requesting their service personally. This is a special request because the Emperor is the embodiment of the country. He is practically a deity. Hirohito leaves and the soldiers are left with their thoughts. They're put through training and tests to teach them basics for flying a plane before the more technical training begins. The soldier has learned from talking to the other kamikaze recruits that, like him, many of the kamikaze pilots went to Japan's best universities before the war. The Emperor isn't just sacrificing the lower classes to the war machine. Instead, some of the most intelligent people in the country are being put into planes loaded with explosives in order to give their lives for Japan. The soldier sits in a classroom with old wooden desks and chairs. The officer at the front of the room teaches lessons around suppressing fear and other troublesome emotions. The soldier is to maintain a clear head and do his duty. That's it. There's no need to worry or be nervous because this is the kamikaze pilot's destiny. There's nothing more important than serving the nation. The officer explains that even if the soldier were to die, it's for a worthy cause and will be the ultimate fulfillment of duty. The lesson ends with the officer commanding the kamikaze pilots in the room to carry out their mission 
or do not return. The soldier wonders if by some miracle he were to survive the mission, what should he do next? His commanding officer just gave him the order not to return, so if he survives, can he go home? Weeks of training go by and the soldier is no longer considered recruit. He's now a kamikaze pilot and will be given his final mission soon. Before his final flight across the Pacific Ocean, the kamikaze pilot is asked to write a letter to his parents. It'll be delivered when his mission is completed. He sits silently looking down at the blank piece of paper. He takes a deep breath and writes seven words that will be delivered to his mother and father upon his death. I have brought honor to our family. The kamikaze pilot folds the piece of paper and places it inside the envelope. On the way out of the barracks, he hands it to his commanding officer. He looks out across the airfield. The tarmac radiates heat. The smell of gasoline fills the air. Mechanics work on engines as soldiers help mount the explosives to the kamikaze planes. The roar of engines is deafening. The airfield is a conglomerate of older plane models. These previously retired planes are now used for one thing, getting loaded with extra fuel and explosives and flown into the side of allied targets. The kamikaze pilot walks toward his aircraft. It's an old fighter plane with a rusty propeller and chipped paint across the fuselage. He runs his hand along the wing, thinking about how this will be the last time he stands on the ground of his homeland. Soon he'll be in the air, and then sent to whatever comes after this life. The pilot grabs onto the warm metal railing of the ladder leading to the cockpit. He climbs halfway up and turns his head to watch his comrades running to their aircrafts and preparing to take off for their final mission. He feels a sense of duty, but also a pain in his heart that he'll never be able to have a family of his own. He releases a sigh and continues to climb. The kamikaze pilot swings his legs over the side of the cockpit and slides into his seat. The flight stick is a little wobbly and the glass on several of the dials is cracked. This plane must have been retired years ago, maybe even before the war had started. He slides the canopy over his head, enclosing himself in the cockpit. The canopy glass has become murky from oxidation in time. The kamikaze pilot looks out at the airfield one last time. He pulls out the choke and signals to the mechanics to start the engine. They pull down hard on the propeller. Nothing happens. The pilot cranes his neck to look at the mechanic. He reaches up, grabs the propeller, and pulls down again with all his strength. The engine roars to life. The propeller turns for a few seconds, and then the engine dies. Could this be a sign, he thinks? He's heard stories of kamikaze pilots being ready to carry out their missions, but the planes wouldn't start. The older modeled aircrafts were stripped to their bones so they could be loaded with more explosives, but very little work was put into maintaining the plane's engines or machinery. The kamikaze pilot sits in the cockpit. He's filled with a mix of emotions. On the one hand, if the plane doesn't start, he'll get to spend more time in the land that he loves. On the other, he'll not be doing his duty to that very country. It's an internal struggle that many kamikaze pilots have to deal with. Another mechanic runs over to the plane with a wrench in his hand. The two mechanics begin frantically working on the engine. The pilot watches as plane after plane takes off from the runway and flies over the dark blue waters of the Pacific. Suddenly, there's a deafening bang. Smoke bellows out of the engine. The propeller begins to turn. It turns faster and faster. The engine hums to life, and the pilot pulls back on the throttle. The engine's making a gurgling sound, and every minute or so spews out black smoke. But the mechanics give the pilot a thumbs up and remove the parking blocks from the tires. He's ready to go. The plane moves toward the runway. He waits for the signal. When it's given, he pushes the throttle to full. The engine roars. Smoke pours out of the exhaust pipes. The plane lurches forward, pushing the pilot back against his seat. He pulls back on the flight stick and the plane rises into the air. He moves toward his squadron and glides into place. They are now airborne and flying toward their target. The fleet of ships they're going to intercept is not too far off the coast of Japan. The time to contact is only a couple of hours. About halfway into the flight, the pilot watches as several of the planes in the squadron run into mechanical problems and plummet into the depths of the ocean. Eventually, the fleet appears on the horizon. They're battleships, destroyers, and an aircraft carrier. They look like little toys in an endless bathtub. The pilot grips the flight stick tighter. This is it. This is what he's been trained for, and this is what the Emperor demands. He'll finish his mission and bring honor to his family and country. The squadron of planes begins to descend. There are bright flashes of light coming from the fleet of ships. The sky is filled with explosions from anti-aircraft shells. The planes dodge and weave around fiery shrapnel and clouds of smoke. The kamikaze pilots are almost directly above their targets. Planes begin taking off from the aircraft carrier to try and intercept as many of the kamikaze aircraft as possible. The Allied forces are well aware of the kamikaze tactic by now. The more desperate Japan becomes, the more dangerous the war gets. They've been planning and putting countermeasures into place. However, if a single kamikaze pilot makes it to its target, the damage can be immense 
The pilot pushes his flight stick forward. The plane goes into a nosedive. He looks to his left and sees one of the other planes blown from the sky by an anti-aircraft shell. He looks to the right and sees a missile that's been deployed from one of the larger aircrafts. He knows that inside this missile is a man and a ton of explosives. The pilot has been crammed inside the missile with no means of getting out since the device was mounted to the plane back at the airbase. The kamikaze missile will free fall for as long as possible, then at the last moment the pilot will engage the thrusters of the missile and he'll maneuver it to his target. The missile is slender and smaller than an aircraft, therefore it's much harder to destroy. The pilot turns his head to look straight through the cockpit windshield. He takes a deep breath and closes his eyes. The battleship he's flying toward gets closer and closer and closer. During World War II, Japanese kamikaze pilots were revered as heroes by their country and deemed an enormous threat by the United States military. These pilots were willing to give up their own lives to serve their country. The word kamikaze means divine wind. We know about how kamikaze missions were used by the Japanese in battles like Pearl Harbor or at naval installations in the Pacific from survivors of such attacks. We also know about the kamikaze pilot experience from individuals who encountered mechanical issues with their planes and were unable to complete their missions. By the end of World War II, almost 4,000 Japanese pilots died in kamikaze missions. It's still disputed how effective these missions were in terms of damage to Allied ships and bases. Kamikaze missions continued all the way up until the end of the war when Emperor Hirohito announced Japan was surrendering on August 15, 1945. Over the years, the Japanese people have viewed the kamikaze pilots with mixed feelings. Some saw them as heroes who were doing their duty during a time of war. Others saw their acts of suicide as shameful. Either way, the life of a kamikaze pilot must have been a difficult struggle between giving up one's life and doing their duty for the glory of the country. This was an internal battle waged within each kamikaze pilot during World War II. June 1944, the U.S.'s 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions and the Army's 27th Infantry Division hit the beaches of Saipan. Just over a week ago, the Allies made landfall in Europe, and Operation Overlord has been a major success. On June 15th, the D-Day of the Pacific begins, and Americans will face one of the toughest battles of their young nation's history. The beaches have been thoroughly cratered by shore bombardments, and on the horizon, 300 American landing vehicles are steadily streaming toward the beach. On other islands, the Japanese have allowed the Americans to make landfall almost unopposed, preferring to fight them at close quarters in the thick jungles where a bevy of booby traps and ambushes awaited them. Saipan is too important. If the Americans capture it, they'll have a key location from which to build air bases where they can strike at Japan and vital Japanese trade routes. Today, the Japanese meet the Americans bullet for bullet on the beaches. The Japanese defenders have been carefully preparing for this attack and have sighted several key positions for their artillery. As the American landing craft steam toward the beaches, sporadic and random artillery fire reaches out to them, causing minor damage to a few L. VTs. However, as they near the beach, the fire becomes much more accurate. Once the landing ramps come crashing down on the first set of LVTs, the artillery fire is downright murderous. Flags set along the beach give precise range information to Japanese artillery and machine gunners, and the American Marines run into a wall of steel. Mines and barbed wire are waiting for the lucky few who escape the vicious rain of steel and shrapnel. Amphibious tanks are just now starting to make landfall, but to the infantry's dismay, the tanks are eviscerated by a round of highly precise artillery artillery fire. Offshore, the ships supporting the invasion fleets try to respond with their own counterfire, but the crews are largely inexperienced in shore bombardment. Only the crew of a few older post-World I era battleships have much training in shore bombardment, and their accurate fire is much appreciated by the men dying on the beach by the dozens. Despite the horrible losses, the Marines manage to secure a beachhead six miles wide and half a mile deep. A steady stream of reinforcements swells the American beachheads, and if the Japanese are to have any hope of preventing the fall of Saipan, Japan, they must throw the invaders back to the sea. The invasion has been a surprise to the Japanese high command, which expected an invasion elsewhere and an emergency relief force is quickly assembled. However, the Imperial Japanese Navy must sink the American Navy to have any hope of reinforcing its besieged troops. Sensing an opportunity to deal a decisive blow to the Americans, Admiral Soemu Toyota, commander-in-chief of the IJN, orders an attack on the U.S. ships around Saipan. If he wins the battle, Saipan can be saved. If he loses it, the island will fall to the Americans. For now, though, the 32,000 Japanese soldiers on Saipan have no hope of reinforcement and are facing an invasion force of over 72,000 Americans. The night
night of the invasion, Japanese forces muster for a massive nighttime counterattack. Most of the Japanese soldiers are battle-hardened from battles across the South Pacific and in China, while the Americans are fielding an even mix of veterans and fresh recruits. U.S. forces should be overwhelmed by the ferocity of a nighttime attack, something thousands of fresh American conscripts have never experienced before. With a mighty roar, several thousand Japanese rush at the American beachheads. Artillery covers their attack at first, but U.S. planes have significantly reduced their number during the daytime counterattacks. As the two sides meet in brutal close quarters combat, the Japanese artillery goes quiet for fear of blowing up their own men. They don't give an inch. The Japanese infantry runs into the teeth of hastily assembled American defenses. The thick jungle gives plenty of cover to the rushing Japanese, seriously diminishing the effectiveness of American machine guns. Nonetheless, American machine guns strafe out into the dark, now being illuminated by parachute flares, repaying the Japanese attackers for the hell the Americans endured from the enemy's machine guns earlier in the day. The Marines are exhausted from a full day of fighting, but if they fail now, the beachhead will collapse and the invasion will fail. The two sides clash together like armies of old, but the American defense is resolute. With a desperate bugle call, the Japanese call for a retreat. After several hours of fighting, the Americans are bloodied, exhausted, and have taken massive casualties. But the beaches have held. For their trouble, the Japanese have suffered crippling losses. It's now clear that the invasion cannot be stopped. Saipan will fall if the Japanese garrison is not reinforced. Four days later, Later, the fate of the Japanese defenders is sealed. The Japanese attack group steaming towards Saipan has run straight into a U.S. submarine picket, who waits until nightfall to radio in the sighting. In the morning, the USS Albacore sneaks right into the midst of the Japanese forces and launches a spread of six torpedoes against the Taiho, the IJN's flagship, and one of its few remaining carriers. Heroically, one of the Japanese pilots just launched off the Taiho spots the torpedoes streaming toward his ship and dives his plane down on top of one, destroying it and himself. Of six torpedoes launched, only one hits, causing minor damage to the Taiho. However, the hit on the Taiho exploded several storage tanks of aviation fuel, and while the damage has been contained, dangerous fumes have begun building up inside the Taiho. At noon, the USS Kavala launches a devastating attack against the carrier Shokaku. Three torpedoes hit home, with one detonating the forward aviation fuel tanks. The Shokaku shudders from the explosion, and planes on her deck in the middle of being refueled erupt into flames. The ship shudders as fires spread out of control. Ten minutes later, the order to abandon ship is given. Suddenly, though, the bow of the carrier begins to sink, and within minutes, she's slipping beneath the waves, taking 75% of her crew with her. Hours after taking what was a glancing blow, an inexperienced damage control officer aboard the Taiho decides to run the ship's venting system at full strength in order to vent out the explosive fuel fumes. Instead, the fumes spread throughout the ship, where they eventually come in contact with an electrical spark. A massive explosion rocks the ship, and the carrier is quickly engulfed in flames. Flames. The Taiho joins the Shukaku at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. The next day, American planes search the Philippine Sea for the Japanese forces. If they slip past the American carriers, they'll be able to reach the landing forces at Saipan. Despite having lost two carriers already, the Japanese fleet would easily devastate the small American force defending the landings, mostly made up of post-World War I ships. Then, at around 3.40 p.m., an American scout finds the Japanese forces. The battle group is at the very limit of the American carrier force's max range, but despite this, a two-wave attack is launched. The Japanese must not be allowed to slip past or the landings will be doomed. And to add to the incentive, the Japanese have few carriers left. Sinking the remaining carriers will hasten an end to the war. An attack wave of 95 Hellcat fighters, 54 Avenger torpedo bombers, and 77 dive bombers roar off the flight decks of the American carriers. As the last plane takes to the sky, the second wave is already being fueled and armed. However, a new sighting report puts the Japanese forces 60 miles further than originally thought. This places them at the very maximum limits of the American planes, and with it being already so late in the day, the planes will have to land at night, an extremely dangerous proposition. The second attack wave is cancelled, better to risk only a part of the carrier's planes on the attack. Hours later, as the sun is setting over the Philippine Sea, the American pilots finally sight the Japanese forces. Japanese oilers are struck by the first planes from the WASP, which are concerned over their low fuel levels. The rest of the attack waves throw caution to the wind and press the attack, knowing that they might not have enough fuel to make it back. 74,000 American Marines and soldiers are counting on them. As the sun slips past the horizon, the American planes spot the main Japanese force and begin a brutal attack. Japanese defenders hastily take to the skies, and anti-aircraft fire from the ships is intense. Despite this, the attack is pressed, and the planes land several direct hits on the carrier Hayo. The carriers Zuikaku, Junyo, and Chiyoda are also damaged, but not seriously enough to be knocked out of commission. The Hayo, however, slips beneath the waves in hours. As the American forces return home, having lost only 20 planes in the attack, the Japanese battle group
group takes stock. It's no longer mission effective and reluctantly, the order to withdraw is given. The fate of the 32,000 Japanese on Saipan has been sealed, but they will not go without a hell of a fight. Back on the island, American forces have pushed the Japanese steadily northwards. The Japanese bunkers litter the jungle, forcing American soldiers to destroy them with the use of flamethrowers and high explosives. Sadly, the civilian bunkers housing the population of 25,000 Japanese residents look exactly like the military bunkers, and many are incinerated or exploded by accident by attacking American forces. A large civilian holding camp is quickly erected, with the lights left on at night in order to lure in other Japanese civilians on the island. After three weeks, American forces have taken two-thirds of the island, and the Japanese are being steadily pushed back. There's no hope of reinforcement, and the Japanese know it. Even if the IJN was capable of braving the resupply run to the island against withering American naval firepower, there are few suitable harbors to offload supplies and reinforcements left available to the retreating Japanese. This is now a battle to the death, and the Japanese Bushido Code demands nothing less than total sacrifice. Surrender is not an option. On July 6, Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito, commander of the 4,000 remaining Japanese troops in Saipan, orders all surviving soldiers and civilians to prepare for a final attack. They've been pushed right into the northern beaches, with only the Pacific Ocean at their backs. There is now nowhere to go but forward, into the teeth of the American invaders. As the sun sets, General Saito draws his sword and gives off a mighty roar, Tenno Heika Bansai. The shout is echoed by thousands of Japanese, jolting the Americans to alertness. The final battle of Saipan is about to begin, and it will be hell for both sides. The Americans are shocked at what they see. A group of 12 men carrying a large Japanese flag charge ahead of a massive formation of ferociously shouting Japanese soldiers. Incredibly, behind the Japanese infantry is a steady stream of the wounded wrapped in bandages and on crutches, some of them only carrying sabers or pistols. Amongst the wounded is a horde of civilians armed with nothing more than sharpened bamboo spears. It is a sight no American soldier has ever seen before or since. The attackers crash into the American defenders with unbridled ferocity. A large gap exists between the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 105th Infantry Regiment, 27th Infantry Division, which has been plugged with anti-tank weapons. The anti-tank guns blow holes in the human tsunami rushing at them, but are inevitably overwhelmed. This has split the Americans in two, and quick-thinking Japanese commanders exploit the situation to surround and overwhelm individual American forces. American soldiers and Marines are swamped on all sides by Japanese attackers, and the fighting soon turns into hand-to-hand -hand combat as rifles are discarded for knives or pistols or used as clubs. The violence is extreme, and the Americans are slowly being overwhelmed, one defensive position at a time. Lieutenant Colonel William O'Brien, however, refuses to let his men be encircled. He brandishes dual pistols as he shouts encouragement at his men. He's severely wounded in the shoulder by a rifle round, but refuses to seek medical attention. As the human wave turns and begins to encircle his position, he orders his men to fall back as he rushes into a jeep and jumps behind the vehicle's 50 caliber machine gun. The steady roar of the Ma Deuce covers the retreating Americans until it's finally silenced. Later, when the battle is over, O'Brien's body will be found at the 50 caliber, surrounded by 30 dead Japanese soldiers. Elsewhere, Private Tom Baker has a long run out of ammunition and now uses his rifle as a club. He smashes the rifle to pieces, fending off Japanese, and finally he and his squad are forced to retreat. As they pull back, Baker is wounded and one of his squad mates picks him up, refusing to leave him behind. The soldier carrying him is killed by Japanese fire, though, and Baker demands that the rest of his squad leave him behind and not risk their lives for him. They leave him with a pistol in eight rounds and prop him up against a tree. Later, he'll be found dead with eight Japanese bodies before him. However, the Japanese bonsai charge would break on one man who would refuse to budge. Captain Benjamin Solomon was a dentist assigned as a field surgeon. As he treats the wounded inside a medical tent, he spots a Japanese soldier trying to sneak inside under the canvas wall. Solomon throws a surgical pan at the man, then grabs a rifle from a wounded soldier and shoots. Realizing that US forces can't stem the tide of the attack, Solomon orders the aid station to be evacuated and he'll personally cover their withdrawal. Solomon jumps behind a 30 caliber machine gun and begins to lay down withering fire on the advancing Japanese. The steady thumping of the 30 cal rings out as the wounded soldiers and staff make their retreat through the dark jungle. Suddenly, it stops. When US forces return after the battle, they discover Salman's body pierced through with dozens of bullet and bayonet wounds and surrounded by 98 dead enemy soldiers. The attack completely overwhelms American forces and crashes down on the 10th Marine Artillery Battery. The artillerymen are forced to drop their howitzer barrels and fire line of sight directly into incoming human waves. Massive explosions tear through the enemy forces, but still the attack continues. The Marines are forced to destroy their own howitzers to keep them from falling into enemy hands and hastily retreat. Elsewhere, men from the 105th are completely cut off from the rest of US forces and are left with only one option, ditching their rifles
rifle and boots, the men jump into the ocean under enemy fire and begin to swim to US destroyers sitting just off the shore. For 12 hours, the bonsai charge continues until finally the human wave is fully and completely expended. The Japanese have advanced 1,000 yards into US lines before finally being repelled, fighting to a man and refusing surrender. US losses are high with 406 killed and 512 wounded. Japanese losses are catastrophic. The entire bonsai attack has been destroyed, with 4,311 dead. In a cave on the beach a mile away, General Saito and his staff commit ritual suicide. The attack will be the largest bonsai charge of the war, and despite the pointless sacrifice, Japan would still lose the war. While the emperor, whose name thousands of Japanese soldiers chanted in their final charge, would go on to live a comfortable life before dying of old age. Want more brutal World War II action? Check out the insane story of the Navy battle that changed World War II, or click this other video instead.